Welcome to Play by Play Podcast, your passport to untold stories of the beautiful game. My name is Patrick Bergman. And my name is Ahmed Ehrim. This is where we're going to tell you about all the untold stories of the beautiful game inside the football and outside the football plays abroad and within the UK, within the game and outside the game, including business. Tell us about yourself. Who is Jack? <laughs> <laughs> nice one. Yeah, good question. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Let me begin by uh, sharing where I currently stand in my journey and how I arrived here. So my name is Jack Biesch and I'm a brand and partnership manager at Footy Addicts, uh, a social football community platform. I'm multicultural, so I'm half Polish and half English. I was born and raised in Poland and have spent all my young adult life in the UK. So there are three chapters to my story, really. Uh, chapter one is uh, the boy named uh, Jacek, that's my Polish name. So it's a young lad who dreamed of uh, becoming a professional footballer, like pretty much uh, everyone really. And so, you know, with all football posters on my walls, I visualized myself on the, in the biggest stadiums. I played football uh, whenever and wherever I could, you know the drill. So chapter two yeah. is the almost pro footballer. So as a young player and an underdog, I won trophies and uh, promotions with two different youth teams. And at the end of uh, probably my best season, I had, a be- I had a price tag of 10K. But you're looking at 20 years ago, and that was like a lot of money back then. So after a few stints in uh, different clubs and actually getting paid to play, I realized it wasn't meant to be. But the feeling, this one important feeling that changed everything remained. It's this uh, deep belief that it's possible to and money doing what you love. Um, and chapter three is um, of the pitch, Jack. So this one starts with uh, my first business venture where, where I was still playing, uh, which failed after a year. And then, you know, I was determined to improve. So I completed a business school and, and design school as well while crafting my skills in the print industry. And fast forward, fast forward to 2020, and I launched a creative agency working with football people. So overall, in the um, last 10 years, I had the great privilege to serve some of the biggest football clubs, charities, and professional footballers. What motivated you to create this community app? So this is not my app. I'm only with the guys for the last two years. But the funny thing is, I had my best time in uh, in business uh, when I was still running my creative agency. And then I just started playing with Footy Addicts, which is like, you can find a kick about new you. And I never heard about this and they were going for like 10 years. I wish I would, I wish I knew the guys uh, before this because they, they have like a big community here in Manchester. But I find out about, about them and I started playing uh, and I also, every time I played, I just, you know, posted something on, on socials because I thought that's that's a genius idea. Uh, and after a while, they, they had this uh, opening for a brand and partnerships manager. I was reading the job description, you know what I mean? And you know when you have this moment when you're just nodding your head when you're reading something? And I'm thinking, mm-hmm. yeah, that could be me. Uh, so I applied for the job, uh, connected with the guys and got it straight away. But the only... The only reason I did this was because of the community community aspect. When you are running a business, it's, sometimes it's a little bit of a lonely uh, space. But at that time, I had like um, clients coming in. Uh, I worked with uh, with ex Premier League footballer. I had I know, uh, had a proposal to work with Tyson Fury, uh, but then you know I'm not into boxing at all. So uh, so I had good things going for me, but I thought. It's probably time for a change and do something like proper meaningful and that's what i did can you tell us about uh, why did you decide to quit football to 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 go into the business industry you know what when all you want to do is play football it's hard to focus on school or de- developing a, any other skills so especially back in the day where there was this stigma that you'll never make it pro because you're distracted doing other things so thankfully, this landscape is changing and you see more players starting their clothing brands or resta- restaurants or building their personal brands in general. So um, for me, it was like I realized I 
uh, it wasn't meant to be. And I knew that only like one, less than 1% of uh, players globally make it pro. And I had to do something. I had to do something else. And I had this, you know, when you sometimes have this burning feeling inside you that, you know, it, it just tells you that, like you could do better, you could do, you could do more. And that's what I had. And I thought, if I can't play football, if I can't be professional, I'll be professional in uh, anything else I choose to do. And for me, that was uh, business and design. What, what kind of skills? Was there any transferable skills that you took from football that transferred really well into your business? Is there anything that people sh should yeah. take on board? Is there anything that you felt the skill is very much transferable? Or what's your opinion and experience from it? Yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's a big one. There are a few things that you can take from sports to business. There's even this book. Um, I can't remember the, the title, but it's it's exactly what what, what it says on tin how to uh, how to take these transferable skills from football to business. Um, but yes, you can take some skills, but you also need to improve the other skills. Like uh, something I took from football is, and I think this. Uh, this, this is something about me as a person. I, I'm very like a detailed person, detail orientated. So I my favorite position was center mid. And, yeah. and when you play center mid, you, you look into all the details. You, you have to have this, mm. uh, you know, have, to have this vision. And when you prepare to games, you have to uh, look at certain things. So that was important. But if there's anything that I think it's not that transferable, is any kind of... Um, like communication skills, for example, for example, mm. uh, negotiations, anything that prepare you to a real life is kind of important. Because when you play, and I bear in mind, I didn't play professionally. But I spoke to many players, and they have uh, agents and or agencies that take care of all their um, stuff uh, apart from football, um, and it makes and it makes you kind of um, you're in this position where you where you don't really experience this. Uh, real life problems like I, I heard about players who didn't even know how to pay bills after uh, after their, their career so mm -hmm. yeah it's uh, it's one of the things that a lot of players experience not that much anymore but back in the days it was it was a massive issue do you think that the players are having more awareness about the life after football yeah 100 percent. so that's exactly what uh, what i noticed when uh, when i finished my career that you go into like different motions. And one of these is like, if I can't play football, what can I do? It's like, you know what I mean? So I noticed this gap and, and started to reach out to other players and use my skills to help them out. So that's how I uh, started my second business, uh, just by trying to be helpful. And I know that many players that like, if for example, you have an injury and that, kind of knocks you out from playing, then obviously you have to do something else. You have bills coming in and, and you have yeah. to find something else. So so even a simple thing like help someone to design their uh, CV, simple as that. It's a simple thing. It was a simple thing for me, uh, but I noticed that more and more players need some kind of support. So nowadays you'll find uh, football clubs starting um, player care uh, programs but it only started like a couple of years ago. I think uh, me and a few other guys uh, started this kind of movement where uh, where you actually you know see players as human beings and uh, you actually want to help them uh, yeah. you know away from the pitch. Obviously, you have uh, you have their agents, but agents usually focus on uh, on transfers, on making sure uh, players taken care of in terms of you know getting another club. There are a few like really decent uh, agents who actually take about who actually care about other stuff, but still don't not that many. Uh, obviously, the landscape is changing. I think it's everything is going uh, better, but um, it's, it's just a matter of time where where you know all the angles are covered. One thing that I would say is how do, a lot of players that I, especially with so many documentaries coming out of life after football mm -hmm. they say that their identity has to die yeah. for them to create a new that how did you get through that um did you have to 
completely replace that identity or did you just end up um morphing it into something else and what was your transition like i mean everyone is different uh, you have to have this individual uh, approach but every single person i believe has at least you know must have more than one passion obviously football is something that uh, every player wants to do but there are so many different things that uh, they can do apart from this like some players like music some players like uh, clothes some players like food so just explore this passion explore this other passion a little bit more maybe there's something mm. there and i'm i would say if you're young try many things um and you know if it doesn't work it doesn't work but be like bold enough to uh, follow this idea uh, and if it doesn't work just fail quick um, mm. and go again with mm. something else yeah, that's actually one business advice i heard that i should fail quick but cheap yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah, it's all about validating uh, business ideas, really. Do you have any any success stories so far with helping the, oh. the young athletes? I can share my personal success story. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I can actually share both. Let me maybe start with uh, my success story because for me, a success is uh, making dreams come true. And um, so, let me ask you a question: Who is your favorite football player? Just give me the name. Bellingham. What about you, Ahmed? Um, past or present? Uh, any? Um, let's say present. I'd say um, Joshua Kimmich. Nice one, mate. So you see, for me, it was uh, Patrick Clifford. Uh, I fell in love uh, with Barcelona and watching him playing. Uh, he had this such a profound style and technique and vision, and and his presence on and off the pitch was just so cool. So there were many great strikers in, in his era. I mean, you're talking about Brazilian Ronaldo, Thierry Henry, and a few others, mm. Dennis Bergkamp. Well, he was my favorite. So when I had my uh, agency, I started a cam campaign where I would post mock-ups of my favorite football shirts on certain anniversaries and, and write a story behind it. So uh, I said in this post that uh, when I was 10, I wrote this letter to Patrick Clifford's uh, fan club. Uh, I didn't want anything, just a reply, a few words to keep me going. And I never got uh, any reply. And the fan club was probably fake anyway. But as a kid, you just don't know better, do you? So after posting this, a friend of mine called Volker van der Heide, he's Dutch, uh, he saw this post and he knew uh, Ajax Amsterdam coach and connected me, me with the man himself, Patrick Clifford. Uh, when he was uh, La Masia director. So I got to spend 20 minutes on a video call with him uh, when, when he was at the Barca facilities. So it was uh, like a very sur surreal experience. Uh, it was like, stop everything. My, my dream, mm. dream just came true. You know what I mean? So it's like it, not every success means money or a status or, or something else. Sometimes it's just this really wicked experience yeah the moments yeah exactly the moments yeah. let's speak more about your your marketing skills mm -hmm. how did you let's speak about the marketing skills in terms of like obviously promoting footy addicts promoting uh, this an enlargement of this community trying to bring that community together um what's what's the general consensus in terms of like what's your end goal for footy addicts or what's this um what is ethos? What is motto? What are you trying yeah. to achieve with it? So, yeah, it's it's a very good question and something that uh, is so important because, you see, I like to work with people who are very in invested in, in the project and with Footy Addicts, I, I found just this. So, like, our mo motto is, uh, like, more than a game, uh, but it really is. Uh, and, like, the, the general mission is to create this happier, healthier, and uh, more social, sociable communities. And what we, what we mean by this is like, the goal is simple. It's just to create more games. And uh, with, with Footy Addicts, we worked uh, on a process where you can join any football game in your area in something like three or four clicks. So this process was uh, very important because you removed a lot of barriers. So at the moment, we are in the nine major uk cities and um, 
or we want to grow, we want to go bigger. And if you think about UK landscape, we have like 76 cities. Uh, we're only in nine, so there's still a lot of ground to cover. Uh, at the moment, we'll focus on, on the UK because every country have a different football culture. We know uh, UK football culture very well, and we just want to provide more opportunities to play football. Uh, we want to go to uh, like de deprived areas. We currently cover a lot, but we want to like give everyone an opportunity to just go out, play a little bit of football and feel better. Are you looking to expand it into more of like tournaments? Are you looking to expand it into more of like a community thing? Because I feel like at the moment, the community is very, let's say, individualized. No one's like a community anymore. No one's like, even like we were, we, were, we had a guest who, um, not so long ago, and she yeah. was telling us stats of like players are not really watching games anymore, and yeah. the attention span to actually watch a full 90 minute is kind of just going down and down and down, especially with the youth. Um, mm -hmm. is so is your end goal is to kind of create more of a community within the youth and uh, obviously older adults, or is it more just kind of just increase as much games as much as possible and try being back the beautiful game at a much uh, higher volume? I mean, there are two two angles to this uh, to this question. Angle number one is uh, every player will, will tell you that they prefer to play football than watch football. Uh, mm -hmm. And I know, and I know, especially within the affiliated game, a lot of people uh, lose their motivation when, for example, um, like a gaffer doesn't like them. And mm. when you're on the bench, you, you don't improve. You lose your uh, motivation, and and you can be as patient as you like, uh, but like losing a full season not playing is just it's just wrong. It is. Mm. So, uh, footy addicts is a little bit different. It's more about the social games, um, and I feel like when you have a chance to uh, to just play whenever you like, whether it's in the morning, in the uh, you know, at lunchtime or, or in the evening, and you don't don't have to ask anyone for permission, and don't have to ask for you know, don't have to stick to the strict rules. It's like a pure form of football, which is absolutely beautiful. And um, and what we notice is, again, it's, it's it's just more than football. This because you can have a kickabout at. 7 p.m. on Thursday, and after this, you, you meet all these strangers, and after this, you can just go to the pub together, get to know it, mm. get to get to know each other. And this is how we build this uh, little local communities. That's the goal, really, to just uh, you know help more people connect, help more people feel better. Can you remind me your your question again, so I can answer, uh, so I can tell you about the other angle? Yes. So, base, yeah, you've answered it perfectly, to be fair. We were trying to get an understanding. Is it more oh. about to kind of create the higher volume in terms of, like, getting a lot of games in, or is it more uh, of a more of a deeper uh, sentimental uh, meaning in terms of, like, try to create more social events, especially try... Um, obviously, you had the where in the UK there's a lot of knife crime so is it more about getting that yeah. community getting the youth off the street is it what's the kind of general agenda or is it more of like there's multiple layers to it at the moment we we are focused on uh, providing this daily football uh, we have an annual tournament uh, which is coming mm -hmm. this June so we only do one event a year and it's like a two days event so on one day, we have a uh, women's and non-binary uh, tournament. And on the second, is like open to all. Bear in mind, all footy addicts games are mixed. Uh, so, you know, you can find a uh, mom and her son playing together, which is uh, absolutely brilliant. We had these stories. Mm -hmm. uh, and what, what we tend to do is whenever we can, we try to find stories and uh, put them in this um, categories as, as well. So actually last year, uh, we created this uh, mini documentary called uh, Beyond the Final Whistle. So we did uh, just this because you have so many different social uh, problems at the moment. It's, it can be loneliness, gender equality, knife crime, cost of living crisis, uh, mental health, disability. So we identified all this and uh, created this mini documentary. And this are absolutely beautiful 
beautiful stories and I wish more people know about this. And where can people find this like the this documentary if they're interested to look onto it? Oh uh, yeah, that's uh, that's on YouTube. Uh, so we have uh, Footy Addicts has a YouTube channel. Uh, not too many subscribers at the moment, <laughs> but it's growing. It's coming. It's growing. It's coming. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and the series is called Beyond the Final Whistle. So we worked with uh, uh, Sam who uh, who used to work for uh, for the BBC. He conducted all the interviews. And we also help to find the right players to to tell their stories, but the players were absolutely brilliant. It was like we had like this twenty minutes window when you can do an interview during the tournament, and they just opened up straight away. It was absolutely brilliant. Okay, so I would like to push push back a bit and uh, ask you about the dealing with uh, with loads of football clubs that you that you mentioned that you did. Mm -hmm. And how was your experience uh, with uh, speaking to football clubs? And uh, if you could uh, mention a few of them, we will be grateful. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so here's the thing. Uh, my first business was a brick and mortar um, sports equipment store. So back then I thought, what, how good would it be to just speak to the players, uh, speak to the football clubs and provide them with sports equipment, whether they, they, these were boots, um, you know, uh, team kits, uh, footballs, whatever it can be. So I did just this. But when you're young, uh, it's like sometimes you lack all this, especially when you uh, come out of football. Uh, you, you have like zero experience. You don't really know how to negotiate. You don't really know how to run operations properly. Um, but I still managed to to run it for, for a year. I didn't lose any money, which is good. Uh, but that gave me this this first uh, real life experience when I was something like 21. Um, and then, you know, fast forward to 2020, I, when I started my creative agency, sorry, going too fast. Uh, in the meantime, I was also working in the print industry. Um, and during this time, uh, we managed to do projects for uh, Man United, uh, Man City, a few other Premier League football clubs. Then I moved to another job when I was a studio manager. So we did some uh, bits and bobs for Rio Ferdinand Foundation. Uh, then I had a few projects with uh, Jesse Lingard, just some small uh, bits and bobs. Uh, but when I run the creative agency on my own, I managed to connect with a few other players. And for me, it's all about relationships. As I said before, I like to work with uh, people who are super invested and excited about their projects. And this relationship shows in the final product. So um, my two favorite football related projects are uh, personal and business branding for Mark Pugh. So he's an uh, experiment league player and obviously brand strategy for footy addicts in my current role. So these are two very different uh, projects with different objectives. Well, you fall in love with projects like this because of the higher purpose uh, to help people improve and do mm -hmm. good through the power of football. How did you meet with uh, Mark Pugh? Because I mm -hmm. uh, don't know if you know, but I ended up working with him yeah. for yeah. six months. So it was a it was very, very great, uh, great experience for me to work yeah. with him. But how did you meet Mark? Yeah, Mark is such a legend. So I knew him as a player. So in my role, uh, when I run the creative agency, I Called, it was called Jack's Branding, believe it or not. And I reached out to all the players I could find. And basically, I, I tried to help them. I tried to offer them a value. Uh, so with Mark, I just noticed that he started his uh, his second, sorry, he started his business um, as a PT, personal trainer. Uh, so he was providing... Um, you know, nutrition plans and fitness plans for his uh, clients. And I thought, right, okay, that is that is really cool. Uh, maybe I can help him with uh, with some branding. And I actually, because I wanted to improve myself, I was a little bit overweight at this time because I didn't play football for like 10 years. Uh, I only, you know, I was going to gym and stuff. So I thought, right, okay, before I do anything, why don't I improve myself first? So I spoke to Mark. Uh, I worked with him first as a client, and then we just built this relationship. I didn't even know, I didn't even expect him to, uh, you know, 
uh, to hire me for for anything branding related but we just had this really deep connection straight away uh, we play football together now <laughs> he's, he's absolutely unreal mm -hmm. uh, but this is how i met him and the rest is just a story <clears throat> i ended up uh, you know working with him on his uh, brand strategy on his uh, brand i did his website um, and yeah that was, that was it. So what's your biggest tip for people that don't have this networking skill, don't have this? What was your, what's your biggest tip and advice for people that are trying to get themselves out there, trying something new in order to build this network and this relationship? Because as you know, in business, your network is your network. What was your, what's your top tip advice? You know what? Like, if you're a young entrepreneur especially coming out of football, you might have this ego and uh, you might think that you know everything. Um, and the real like seasoned entrepreneurs know their limitations and know that they have to uh, build teams. So what I, would, uh, what I would suggest is having a team or someone to bounce ideas off is everything. So ideally you'd have an accountability partner or a group of friends to <clears throat> to give you instant feedback and check if you're on uh, on the right track, uh, because when you're working on projects, if the only people who give you uh, feedback are, are your clients, then you need to rethink your process. You know, you can use a group of friends to test, uh, you know, user experience for your clients, and believe me, your clients will uh, appreciate this. But also. I think it's very important to uh, go to as many uh, events as you can. So what I tend to do, sorry, let's go back again. So what you want to do is uh, connect with people in, in the sports industry, for example, and get, us, get to as many events as you can and talk to people, ask questions and be interested in, in them and then follow up. And uh, maybe there's one person who could uh, actually become your mentor. And um, because, you know, believe it or not, but asking someone to mentor you is the biggest compliment you can give them. And I learned this from Aaron Burns, ex-Man United player. I think this is very important. And what I, tend, uh, what I used to do is like, uh, I used to find different events and usually the paid events are, are so much better. It can cost you anything from like 10 pounds to, to 50 pounds or even, you know, 1000 pounds, depends where you want to go. But you'll get this uh, list of attendees so you can connect with them before the event and say, oh, I'm going to this tournament. I, I saw you on the list. Uh, you know, what do you do? Just, just be a normal human being. During this uh, event, you can all, all, always, you know, go to people, shake hands, speak to them. And after the event, if you didn't manage to meet someone uh, that you were interested in connecting with, uh, you can all, always, uh, you know, just say hello after the, <clears throat> after the event. And I think... Having this uh, accountability partner or asking someone to to mentor you, even if you think that you know everything, there's always something that that they might know better or they might have bigger knowledge because of, of their experience. So that would be probably the, the biggest tip. Very good tip. Did you have any mentors yourself, <laughs> either in football um, or in business? Well, I wish uh, I wish I was smarter. And so in football, I was always looking up to all the players, obviously, like like everyone. Sometimes you just see someone in training and, and you feel like, oh, I could do this better. I really need to work on this. I feel like many players have uh, have similar experience, uh, the, you know, especially the ones that, that really want to improve themselves. Um, and obviously looking at, you know, these days you, you can just learn everything on YouTube. If you want to improve a certain skill, you can just watch it on YouTube, but there's nothing like working one-on-one -on -one with uh, with someone. So when I was a young player, I had the chance to have like, you know, a friend of, uh, a friend of a friend was a personal trainer. And that was like such an unpopular, um, unpopular career back then, bear in mind that was 20 years ago. And I had a chance to work with him, but it, it would cost me something like, and I don't know, 50 quid a month or something. I felt, I felt like I can't really afford this. I wish I, I wish I would go for it because I knew it would uh, improve everything. Like strength is so, so important. Uh, but I didn't do this. And, and then 
that's probably uh, one of the reasons I, I failed in football. And um, when it comes to uh, business, I, I again, with my first business, I had a friend who ruined like proper big business and I didn't know I could just go to them and ask them for help. I wish, uh, I wish I would do this, but again, I was a little bit like, oh, I can figure it out myself. If I ask for help, it means uh, that I'm weak or something. You know, you know, there was this stigma uh, that if you ask for something, especially as a man and especially as a footballer, it's like you're not good enough. But well, it's bullshit. It's mm. so, it's so, it's so wrong. If you can't just ask for help, because uh, it can only uh, help you, it can only improve you. So I learned my lesson, and when I was running my second business, I signed up for like a creative uh, group. So we had meetings like every week, and then I found an accountability partner uh, with mentor. That was a little bit different because I didn't know someone who would be who would run a similar business to mine because I felt like what I was doing back then was pretty unique. Uh, so I felt like if if people don't really understand fully your industry and what you're doing, it might be quite, um, you know, quite challenging to com communicate. But again, I feel like that wasn't completely true because you'll, you will learn a lot from people in different industries uh, just by sharing your experiences because they might have a different experience. And mm -hmm. even when you build a high-performing team, it's important to have people with different skills. I know, I know, I know. I'm sorry for breaking the podcast. Just one announcement, okay? Check out our channels on Instagram, on TikTok, on Facebook, play-by-play -play podcast. Even having someone learn, sometimes when you're speaking things out, you sometimes... Yeah kind of formulate a solution unconsciously yep. without you knowing. And then because they're questioning things or because they're painting things uh, in a different light, it kind of gives you that aha moment or a light bulb moment. And you'll be like, oh, yeah. And then you kind of figure it out. So it's good in terms of to kind of map out your, your strategies and uh, your journey to success is really important just to have someone there, definitely. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. And you know, when you have like, I would advise, or <laughs> if I could give any more tips to to anyone, especially um, young players or young entrepreneurs or whatever, uh, just find someone who you can meet every week and just uh, you know document your process, share what are you doing, what are you trying to achieve, and you know just. And do the same for the other person. Just ask questions. Don't judge them. Uh, don't tell them something that they should do. Just ask them questions. How do you feel about this? What did you What did you do last week? What are you planning to do this week? How do you feel about this? You know, stuff like this, like really help. Because everyone can figure out things in their head. Mm. Uh, but pushing someone in, in the direction that they don't want to do doesn't really work. Yeah, 100%. Mm. For sure. Unfortunately, we have one minute left. Uh, tell us about your <laughs> your plans for the future, and we cut. <laughs> so, I mean, the plans for the future. Um, I just so with I'm so invested and so focused on footy addicts at the moment. We currently have two hundred thirty thousand registered users. Uh, I would love this to be one million in the next five years. Okay. And maybe a little bit longer. That that's a big plan. That's amazing, and hopefully you can go all throughout UK and worldwide, that would be really, really amazing and convenient. Yeah, we want to be this hub where um, we have all football events, football trainings, um, football games, anything. We just want to be this one-stop shop. I think yeah. it would be a great app to use in Poland, to be honest. It's <laughs> yeah. Many people wanting to to play pickup games in Poland. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, I was thinking about this. But again, every country has different football culture. And in some countries, you can't really hire a pitch. So somewhere it's just free. And mm -hmm. so as long as it would work for a platform as Footy Addict, because the, the platform is free, it will be uh, difficult to invest time and uh, energy into this. Uh, so we would have to have people in there who want to do them, who want to do this for themselves. Wow, that was an episode. If you want to see more, check out this one.